So in May, in one of the odder political developments of this period, in May 1864, a convention of radical Republicans plus some actual abolitionists, including Frederick Douglass, I think, well, I don't know if he's there, but he endorses it, um, meet in Cleveland to nominate their own candidate for president. And they choose John C. Fremont, who had been the first Republican candidate in 1856. Why do they choose Fremont, who was a disaster as a general in Missouri? Because remember, in 1861, Fremont had issued the first Emancipation Proclamation in the war when he had declared all the slaves of Missouri free and Lincoln had overturned his order. That was September 1861. So Fremont had this image among the radicals as being more forthright, more you know, willing to fight, willing to go to the limit than Lincoln, because Lincoln had overruled him. So Fremont, and also Fremont's a popular guy. He's a known quantity. He'd run before. Fremont is nominated to run for president on a platform which calls for a constitutional amendment to end slavery, uh, congressional control of Reconstruction. Hold that till next time when we will talk about the rise of Reconstruction as an issue in the war and national protection of the rights of the freed people short of the right to vote. They do not, they, they don't think it's popular yet. They do not call for the right to vote for black men, but they say the civil rights of the former slaves must be protected by the national government. They also call for the confiscation of land in the South of rebels um, and its redistribution among soldiers and settlers. They don't really say much about the former slaves, but you take the land of the planter class, redistribute it, send northerners down into the South. The, the position is put forward by Wendell Phillips, the great abolitionist now, in a sense, working as a Republican Party factional, uh, a member of a Republican Party faction. Here's what Phillips said. This is what we should do as of the summer of spring, summer 1864. Subdue the South as rapidly as possible. The moment territory comes under our flag, reconstruct rebel states as follows. Confiscate and divide the lands of the rebels. Extend the right of suffrage as broadly as possible. Phillips wants black suffrage. Forbid the states to make any distinction among their citizens on account of race or color. What I'm trying to say here is that the issue of the post-war world is now part of politics. Even though the war is not over by any stretch of the imagination, already the issues of Reconstruction are on the national agenda. What's going to happen to land in the South, if anything? What are going to be the rights of the former slaves? Who's going to have the right to vote? Who's going to control Reconstruction, the President or the Congress? All those issues are raised by the Radical Republican Convention that nominates uh, Fremont for, um, for president. As I say, the role of abolitionists, particularly Garrisonian abolitionists who had always opposed voting, opposed taking part in the political system, now they are, instead of moral agitators standing outside the political system, now they are acting inside the political system. They're politicians, in other words. They've become politicians. But as time would quickly show, they weren't very good politicians. Lincoln was a much better politician than William Lloyd Garrison or Wendell Phillips. That's Lincoln's job, being a politician. So Lincoln is able to outmaneuver them, but any president would certainly see a split in his own party as a pretty serious problem with a, re, you know, a, the, a presidential election uh, coming up. So uh, Fremont refuses to withdraw his candidacy, even though a number of Republicans are demanding it. And as the summer of 1864 goes along, Lincoln's prospects for re-election seem to diminish, again, because of what's happening on the battlefield. Um, in the summer of 1864, Ulysses S. Grant, who had won several battles in the West, is brought 
to the east to command the Army of the Potomac against Lee. Lincoln feels he's finally got a general who can fight Lee on an equal basis. Supposedly, when uh, people said to Lincoln, you know, uh, we've heard that Grant drinks. He did drink. Occasionally he was drunk. Lincoln said, hey, f find out what he's drinking and get it to the other generals. Because <laughs> it doesn't seem to have affected his military uh, efficiency. So Grant comes forward with a plan for hard war, as we have been calling it, to move against Lee but all, and, and other Southern armies all at the same time. One army under General Franz Siegel is going to move up the Shenandoah Valley here, the breadbasket of, of Virginia, this tremendous, wonderful valley with all sorts of farms and crops feeding the army, feeding much of the South. Franz Siegel is going to go up the Shenandoah Valley, forcing Lee to send troops to defend it and destroy whatever he can, food supplies for the Confederate Army, okay? Um, by the way, who has seen the statue of Franz Siegel around here? Where is it? Yeah, 106, exactly. Go up down to 106 and you'll see a big statue of Franz Siegel on his horse. He wasn't much of a general, frankly, but uh, he's got a statue anyway. Um, in fact, he failed abysmally in his assault on the Shenandoah Valley, meaning that Lee did not have to send very many troops to push him back. Um, another army under Ben Butler was going to advance on Richmond from the east, but he flubbed that also. Meanwhile, better uh, done, General William T. Sherman was going to move down into Georgia from Tennessee, heading toward Atlanta, another major rail junction. So what is the point here? It's what, it's what Grant calls, he said, I'm going to advance all along the line, a coordinated assault all over the place. That is obviously the way to maximize the impact of the Union superiority in manpower. You don't go for one battle. You attack everywhere. Somewhere, they're not going to be able to defend it because they don't have the, the manpower you do. If you concentrate on one battle, they'll concentrate on one battle. If you attack all along the line, you're going to suffer a lot of casualties doing that, but you're going to break through somewhere. And Grant uh, understands that. So now the North has what the South never achieved. See, Lee is a great battlefield commander, but he doesn't have this larger strategic sense. Lee is interested in Virginia, very important. There's never any real coordination between the war in the West and the war in the East for the Confederacy. Grant now gives this coordination to numerous uh, military operations at the same time. And he himself, in May 1864, moves the Army of the Potomac against Lee, and what follows is a month of the most horrific fighting in, in the American history, really, until, I don't know, World War II or something. Um, the Army of the... Because in May 1864, the armies are fighting every single day. It's not like Gettysburg three days. It's not like Antietam one day. Every single day, Grant is on the attack against Lee's army, uh, sometimes in conditions which are almost impossible to fight in. The war begins in what they call the wilderness, a deserted, shrub-covered area. One, uh, one rep this is where, uh, unlike most battles, you do have hand-to-hand -hand fighting, you do have bayonet wounds, because nobody can barely see where they are or know where they are. Uh, it was a wrestle, one reporter said, as blind as midnight in, midnight in a gloom that made maneuvers impossible, a jungle where regiments stumbled upon each other without even expecting it. Um, the part of the forest was set on fire by the battle, and wounded soldiers burned to death if they couldn't get out of the fire. It was as if Christian men had turned to fiends. Wild cheers, savage yells rose above the sighing of the wind. In two days of fighting, Grant lost uh, 18,000 casualties. That's mostly wounded, some dead. Lee lost 7,500. But 
After that, every other um, Union general, after uh, battles like that, had stopped and retreated. Not Grant. He pushes forward. Um, Spotsylvania. Day after day, there's these, um, there, there's these battles. Well, first of all, there's Lee, of course, the gentleman soldier. There's Grant, looking a little scruffier in front of his tent. And um, here's the, some of the dead at Spotsylvania. This is just one of the numerous battles of May 1864. Cold Harbor. Grant later said in his memoirs, this was the one mistake, the one thing he regretted was an assault at Cold Harbor, again in Virginia, where, which was repulsed with very high casualties. By the end of May, one month, Grant's casualties, dead, wounded, and missing, were 50,000. That's the size of Lee's army to begin with. Lee's casualties were less, but Lee could not afford casualties, and Grant could. 